Good morning, friends. Uh, it's an honor to be in worship with you this Labor Day weekend. I hope that you're having a restful and relaxing Labor Day weekend. I always think about the context out of which Labor Day was born, which of course was ripe with tension and conflict at a cultural or national level. In some ways, it seems like the more things change, the more things stay the same, which invites of us this Labor Day weekend, I think, uh, an opportunity to reconsider what is the community that God is inviting us to build. And that always tends to draw my attention towards the letter of James. James is one of those letters that it's easier for us to kind of forget about because it's at the end of the New Testament. It's getting towards the book of Revelation. And the closer we get to Revelation, uh, the more anxious and sweaty we tend to get. So maybe uh, for some of us, it's easier to just not read it. But really, it's a wonderfully practical letter that explores how we can build a Christian community. What does it look like for us to be in community with one another, which uh, I think is precisely the kind of thing we need to be considering as a church and as Christian people in this particular moment. Uh, there's an author called um, Margaret Wheatley who wrote a book, Who Do You Want to Become? And some of it is not so good, but, uh, but there's an image that she uses there called an island of sanity. She talks about as leaders in our culture today, what we need to be building is islands of sanity in a world of chaos and insanity. I love that image. And I think that's what, um, what Christian community, what church could be for us in this particular season. Uh, and James is a great resource for helping us figure out what that looks like. He's also a great resource because let's not forget who James actually is. He's a leader in the early church, particularly in Jerusalem, but he's also the brother of Jesus. James was the brother of Jesus. And so he brings a, a sibling intimate level uh, knowledge of who Jesus was and what Jesus was trying to do, coupled with, um, uh, coupled with uh, one of the first experiences of trying to tie together Christian belief with Christian living. And that's something that is absolutely crucial throughout James's letter. So we have here the brother of Jesus exploring for uh, one of the first times, how do we connect what we believe with how we behave, with what we believe with, with how we live? So remember that at this point, the church is small. It has no influence. It has no power. It is simply a group of people, much like us, trying to figure out what does it look like for us to live in a Christian way in a culture that desperately needs us to show up with vision for community that is powerful and compelling? So chapter two in James's letter, I think, cuts straight to the heart of it. The end of chapter one talks about hearing and doing the word. And then at the beginning of chapter two, James begins to use a, uh, an example to explore this right out of everyday life. So that's where I'm going to begin. James says, my brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? I love the tone there. Do you really believe as you show favoritism to, to some groups and not to others? Can you really say that you believe in Jesus Christ? I love the connection, right? James understands that our belief must guide our behavior, right? Belief that's disconnected from behavior isn't really belief. So our belief in Christ must guide our behavior, and that's what he's really challenging this community on. Do you really believe? Even as you show favoritism, do you really believe in Jesus Christ? And by the way, the, the converse is true as well. Our behavior will reveal what we really believe, Right? If our behavior is different than what we say we believe, then how we behave is probably a truer indicator of what we actually believe than our words are from time to time. So then he jumps into uh, an example from everyday life, and he says this, For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, then you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and you say, here, have a seat here. And to the other one who is poor, you say, stand over there or, or sit at my feet. 
Right? He's challenging their, their sense of favoritism. He says, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Later on uh, in the passage, he says, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors down in verse 9. James seems to take this really seriously, uh, right? He, he, he paints an image of uh, polite hospitality that's displayed towards people of means with a dismissiveness that's displayed towards the poorer folks in their community. And he says, this cannot be how we behave if we also believe in Jesus Christ. That connection between belief and behavior is already coming out. And on the one hand, we want to say, okay, James, I get it. We're supposed to be nice as Christians to everybody. And this feels like very Christian-y advice from James. On the other hand, he seems to just take it a little bit too seriously, right? If we show partiality, then we've become sinners and are convicted by the law as transgressors. There seems to be something more and something weightier for James at stake here, aside from just be nice to people. And here's what I think we might miss in this uh, attack on favoritism. I think sometimes as Christians, we've been trained to believe that our story begins with this. You are a sinner who has fallen short of the glory of God, right? The beginning of the Christian story for a lot of us comes from Paul. And it's not wrong that we are sinners, that we have fallen short of the glory of the God. The problem is, that's not the beginning of our story. That's chapter 3 of our story. Genesis chapter 3 is the story of our fall. It's the story of of, uh, of rebelling against God and refusing to be who God made us to be. The story actually begins in chapters 1 and 2, as these things often do, right? In chapters 1 and 2 in Genesis, we hear the beginning of our story that God creates and looks at his creation and says, this is good. And then God creates humankind. He creates man and woman. In his image, God creates them and says that they're good. That's the piece that we often forget that our story begins in goodness. It's later that we rebel. It's later that the image of God within us, some call it the imago Dei, the imago Dei within us is tarnished and Jesus in his grace and glory comes to restore that image of God within us. But our story begins in the goodness of God's creation, that we have been created in the image of God. So James then rejects favoritism not because it's not nice. James rejects favoritism because it is a rejection of the image of God in our brothers and sisters, in our brother or our sister. And so yeah, he says you can't dismiss entire groups of people because that's akin to saying, you know, the image of God in you isn't really worth my time. I find the image of God in this group of people more valuable than the image of God in this group of people. It makes no sense. And in fact, it's an offensive uh, thought to God. It's an affront to God's creation of all people in his image. So James rejects it and says, look, you can't reject poor folks because you think they don't have anything of value to bring to the conversation or because you think they somehow deserve their poverty. But the converse is true too. You can't reject rich folks because you think perhaps they cheated their way into wealth and they, they, uh, they're unfaithful because they have wealth. James says you can't reject either one because the image of God lives in both groups of people. You can't reject conservative folks because you think they're stodgy and rigid and, and old-fashioned. And you can't reject progressive folks because you think, ah, they're just trying to change all the rules all of a sudden. The image of God resides in both. So you can't reject one or the other because that's a rejection of God's image in those people. You can't reject people of color. You can't reject white folks. You can't reject any category of people because it is a rejection of God's creation. Not just a, an example of Christians being mean. It's a rejection of God's own creation. So James, when he says, you can't show favoritism, I think is relying on a tradition that honors the image of God that resides in all people. And then he gets really down to brass tacks in verse 8. He says, look, you'll do well if you really fulfill 
the royal law. I love that title, the royal law. A royal law comes from a king, by the way. So if a king is offering this law, that king is Jesus, and we probably ought to listen to it. He says, you do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right? James ties this ethic of equality to Jesus' to the heart of Jesus' teaching. Well, from Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that, of course, relies all the way back on Leviticus 19, verse 18, which says the same thing. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It turns out that from the beginning, the project that God has laid before his people has always, for all people, in all times, in all places, the project has always been pretty simple. Not necessarily easy, but pretty simple. Love your neighbor as yourself. We don't show partiality towards some neighbors and not to other neighbors because all of our neighbors have been made in the image of God and because God has loved us, so we return that love towards all of God's creation. James goes on and he says, For whoever keeps the whole law but falls in one point has become accountable for all of it. James here, really, this is where the rubber meets the road. There's no hidden mystery here. There's no secret knowledge. It's not complicated as it turns out. I think Christians have made Christian living far too complicated when Jesus was simply, was making it simple. And James is doubling down on that. Jesus says simply, love your neighbor. When somebody comes in who's in need, love them. When somebody who comes in who has means, love them. When somebody comes in who agrees with everything you believe, love them. When somebody comes in who disagrees with everything you believe, love them as well. That's the ethic of equality that Jesus and James are bringing to the table. N.T. writes, uh, an Anglican uh, uh, pastor and author, tells a great story about the early church he would talk about how um, when, a, uh, when, when somebody who was poor would come into a worship gathering, rather than relegating them to the side, they heard James's words, rather than pushing them aside in the gathering, the bishop would stand up, greet that person uh, who had no means and no power and no authority. The bishop would greet them and bring that person to sit with them. They would elevate that person not set them to the side. I love that as a, as a great illustration of how, of how the early church heard James's teaching and said, that's who we're going to be. So friends, as we think about what it means for us to build community that's gonna survive this current cultural moment that is hell-bent on dividing us, I pray that we will hear James's words. I pray that we will hear James's admonition to leave favoritism behind. James hammers favoritism because he knows the insidious power it contains to pull us apart, right? Favoritism pulls at the fabric that holds us together, creates sides that set us against one another. And James says that cannot be how we relate to one another. Instead, instead we will live by the royal law of liberty, the law of Jesus that says love your God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the kind of community that will not only withstand and survive a culture that's hell-bent on destroying community, that's the kind of community that will draw people in. That's the kind of community that will be compelling to a world that, was, that is hungry starving even, to know what it means to belong, to know what it means to be loved. This Labor Day, I hope that you have an opportunity to rest and relax, but I also hope that you'll have an opportunity to reflect on the ways in which you might be showing favoritism and on the ways that God is calling us to something deeper and better. Thanks be to God. Amen.